Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to sit here. Uh, so if you want to see me, then make sure that you can. Um, but actually, the screen is going to be the star, because the idea here is to code a, um, an async framework with Python and coroutines in Python 3 within the next 40 minutes. Um, this is an experiment. I haven't done this before. The point is not for me to show off to you like what a great coder I think you should think I am, but uh, you know, it's not about that. I've rehearsed this. Uh, that's why I can do it, not because I'm a genius. Um, the point is really to try to communicate that um, async I.O. and coroutines, although they seem obscure and special, are uh, quite accessible. And um, at least a, a minimal implementation is simple enough that we can throw it together in half an hour or less. So that's the idea. So the agenda is going to be, we're going to start off by implementing an async framework. So that means that it's going to use non-blocking sockets with callback functions and an event loop to schedule I.O. And then we're going to talk a little bit about why you want to do this, why this is efficient at uh, solving certain kinds of problems. But we're also going to see that there's a big problem with it, which is that callbacks are disgusting, especially in Python. So we're going to replace them with coroutines. And what we're doing is we're going to rewrite minimally the kinds of coroutines that are implemented in the Python 3.4 standard library in a module called async.io. And those coroutines are implemented using a class called future, a Python language feature called generators, and another class called task. So the setup is I've got a, um, a little web server running on my laptop, and it serves a few kilobytes of ASCII. And it's deliberately written to be rather slow. It takes a second to respond to this request. It streams down the bytes slowly. So let's fetch that URL. So first we need a socket. And we're going to connect it to localhost. And we want to format an HTTP request. Uh, so we'll substitute the path in there. Ashish was looking at these slides earlier and pointed out that there is a um, header injection <coughs> vulnerability, but I'm going to ignore that. <coughs> Uh, and then we send the request to the server. And then we want to stream back its response. So we're going to uh, make a list here and then just loop and say um, we're going to get a chunk. I'll just say we'll accept up to 1,000 bytes, but whatever you can give me is fine. And uh, if you gave me something, I'll store it. Otherwise, that means that the server's shut down its side, and so we're ready to um, kind of put the body together and print it out. So we'll make an empty byte. This is Python 3, so we have to be very careful about bytes versus strings. We'll use that to join the chunks, uh, and then we'll decode that. Nope. Decode that. And then we've got the full body, so let's just print that out. So um, let's just see if this works. No, because I need to encode the request. Start it over. OK. So great. So we download a bunch of ASCII. And yeah, stop. <laughs> great. Um, ah. You see what I did wrong, right? Return. Otherwise, you're in a while true loop. OK, great. So we're done. Uh, and let's see how long that took. OK. 
So I expect it to, to take about a, th about a second, because that's what I wrote the server side to do. And um, it's sort of annoying to see all that output. So let's um, split this by line and just print out the first line. OK, so great. So downloading a URL is pretty easy, right? Um, and what if we want to download two URLs? So here's the problem that we're trying to solve, is that downloading two URLs takes twice as long as downloading one URL. And that's dumb because the client is spending most of its time waiting for I.O. It should be able to uh, interleave the operations of downloading chunks. So the traditional way of doing this would be to launch these get operations on separate threads. And that would work great. That's the standard way to do it in Python. Even uh, in Python, where there's a global interpreter lock, the uh, Python um, socket module releases that lock while it's waiting for I.O. So it can actually interleave I.O. using multi-threading. And with multi-threading, we could easily get this down to one second. But we're not going to do that because we want to show async. So let's see, first of all, what async is, and then we'll talk about why that might be superior to multi-threading under some circumstances. So the first thing about async is it uses non-blocking sockets. And the thing about a non-blocking socket is it doesn't block. It either returns a it either succeeds or fails immediately. And when it fails, it raises an exception. But no matter what, it never waits to succeed. So if we run this, we'll throw an exception, and it's a blocking I.O. error. And that came from this line, which does connect. So the very first time that we tried to do anything with this non-blocking socket, it raised because it could, couldn't do it immediately because we've set it into non-blocking mode. So let's just ignore that and continue. <laughs> and now we throw on the next line where we try to do the next thing, which is to send the request. But again, we're non-blocking, so we can't do that yet. So we need some way to wait for the connection to complete before we can proceed. So the way we're going to do that is, generally in Unix, with a non-blocking socket, you use select or pull to wait for an event to occur on that socket. And in modern times, there are more scalable interfaces with names like ePoll on Linux and KQ on BSD. Windows has something called IO completion ports. Um, the neat thing in Python 3.4 is that we don't have to care about that anymore. There's this new module called selectors. And we can just say, give me whatever is best on this platform. And then here we can say, uh, selector register the file descriptor, which is just some number that describes the socket that I opened. I want to know when the socket is writable, because I want to send something on it. And when it's writable, I want you to call some function. Now we need to define this function. So we can start writing that down here. We can say, we'll call it connected. That's the event that it's waiting for. And uh, you'll notice that like PyCharm is sort of losing its mind because path and s are no longer defined here because we're not in the same function that we were in before. So we need to get that in somehow. Let's say that there are arguments. And then we need to store those away before this function exits. So let's make a uh, closure. So we do that with lambda. And we're going to call connected um, s in path. All right? And so that'll be the third argument to register. That's what we're going to do once the event that we're waiting for is ready. Now, this argument, it's just called data. This call itself doesn't actually schedule the callback to be executed. We're not there yet. An async framework will do that for us. 
but we don't have an async framework yet. We're in the middle of writing one. So we need to do that down here. We need to actually call selector select in order to ask it about events on the sockets that we registered up here. And select has, uh, it returns a list of events. And what the events are, um, it's a little awkward. Uh, it's a list of key mask pairs. And the mask, we don't really care about that. It tells us what happened. But in this case, we know what happened. We wouldn't know about this event. I mean, the only thing that we're waiting for is for the socket to become writable. So we know that that's what happened if we get here. Uh, if we're waiting for multiple events, that might be useful. I haven't actually seen it used. What we really care about is the key data. That's what we passed in here. It gets returned to us here. So that is the callback function. And when we get it, we know that whatever it's waiting for is ready, so we execute it. So that'll jump back in here, and then that'll jump back in here. So if we run this now, what's going to happen? Oh. Another exception, and this time it was in chunk receive, because again, you can't do anything with a non-blocking socket that will block. So here, uh, let's just to get things going. Let's just ignore that, too. Uh, OK, fantastic. So we completed. But um, this is still sort of um, shoddy, because it's still taking two seconds to download two URLs, even though it's spending most of its time waiting around. And the reason for that is uh, this while true loop, right? We can't be interrupted while we're in here. And so the other callback never gets a chance to call receive on its socket, as long as the first callback is running. So we need to do the same arduous transformation again over here. So it's going to be like, all right. So first of all, we want to unregister for write events, because we're no longer interested in that. And then we send the request, and then we start the buffer. And then we're going to uh, re-register for events. And here we want the event read. Auto-import that for me, please. Thank you. And uh, we're going to register another callback. So what's that going to be? Um, let's call it like readable. That's what we're waiting for. Um, and now we're in a new function. So what do we need? We need s again. And we also need buff. Is that everything? So we'll make a, um, another closure here. Readable s buff. All right. Um, so that's going to run every time the socket becomes readable. Uh, we want to get rid of this while true, right? Because it's going to be the function itself is now going to be re-executed each time that the event occurs. So we don't need a loop anymore. The nice thing is we don't need the try except anymore either because this function is now only going to be called when what it's waiting for is ready. So it won't throw a blocking I.O. error now, because it will only be executed when the socket <laughs> is readable. Um, the final thing we want to do, just to kind of manage our um, timing, is we want to unregister the socket, receive what it's got so far, and then uh, if chunk is not empty, that means that there's more ready. So the third, and I promise the final time, we will create a callback, that's a closure, and register for events. Um, all right, let's see if I got this right. No. Uh, what did I do wrong? Here's where it all goes down. Can anybody see what I did wrong? Ha. Huh. Well, I believe that this version will work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Brilliant. Um, I wonder what the difference is between these two. Is the global? Oh, that's true, but I haven't actually, I'm not there yet. So this, oh, ah. Okay, let's actually go back to the code that I was working on. So what's wrong here is this is not an event loop, right? We only register for one event, and then as soon as we get it, we leave. So as soon as we got one socket connected, we quit. That yeah, was a teaching moment for us all. This was worth it after all. So what we need is not to wait for a single event, but to have an event loop. So now if we run the live one, okay, so we hit my breakpoint. Let's resume from there and Okay, great. Gonna wait for my heart rate to go down. Um, <laughs> so we solved that problem. We've got the two URLs, but now we've got another problem, which is that uh, my process is still running. It hasn't actually finished yet. I have to force kill it. And why is that? Well, it's because it's got a well true loop in it. So um, let's kind of Let's make some number and jobs. This is the number of things we're working on. When we start fetching URL, here's where that global comes in. Let's declare end jobs to be a global. In Python, you have to, if you're going to um, modify a variable, you have to declare a global in order to affect the outer scope. Uh, and then let's increment it. And then down here in readable, <coughs> When we're done with something, we're going to decrement it. We don't actually need, that return statement is now redundant. Um, and then this guy, we can iterate not forever, but while there are jobs. So when the second URL is complete, that'll go to zero and we'll quit. So success, and we're now able to download two URLs in one second because each time a socket becomes readable, we execute its callback and it finishes very fast, right? It executes 10 lines of code, it doesn't block for anything, it only gets these chunks, sometimes they're 1,000, sometimes they're less. It just gets whatever's available in the TCP, TCP buffer and then it just returns immediately. So that means that we're not actually spending very much time processing at all. We're spending all of our time waiting for the two sockets. And therefore, we can start both connections, start both fetches, complete both fetches, all more or less concurrently. So we've reached the midpoint of the demo. We've got an async framework that uses callbacks. And the advantage here is that if we were scaling out to tens of thousands of concurrent fetches of some slow site like this one, we could do it without creating tens of thousands of threads. In Python, generally speaking, 10, 15,000 threads on most systems, including this one, you'll hit some limit that may be very hard to get past. Um, but with async, the resources that we devote to downloading each of these URLs is minimal. Each of them has what? It's got a buffer, it's got a socket, and it's got a reference to a callback that's been registered with the selector, and that's it. That's all we need to wait for the next chunk of a URL. We don't need a whole thread with its stack and its entries in the operating system's scheduler tables. So you can scale out to a much larger number of slow I.O. operations using async than you can with threads. Now, it's not good if you're doing a lot of processing because you can only use one CPU core with async. Of course, that's true even with threads in Python. Um, if you want to use multi-core, you've got to find some other solution. Um, but async is great if you're doing I.O. concurrency and not much computation. But, so that's what's good. Uh, what's bad, um, it's complicated, right? Compared to my original blocking example, we've now exploded out to 60 lines of code and we've got three functions with callbacks and blah. So the next step is let's convert to coroutines. 
And so coroutine, it's made of a future, a generator, and a task. And so let's create the future first. And this is borrowed from a lot of frameworks have this kind of idea, but this is going to be um, the sort of thing that Python standard async IO uses. So I'm going to make it super minimal. I'm just going to say it's got a list of callbacks. And when you resolve the future, it runs its callbacks. And so future kind of wraps up a callback. So let's do that here. We'll make a future. We'll append the callback to it. And then instead of registering the callback directly, we'll, wrap, we'll uh, register the future that um, wraps it. And then we'll do the same transformation three more times. Right, so here again, we wrap the callback in a future and register that. And then one last time. And then down here, the data is no longer the callback itself. It's some future that wraps a callback. And whatever what it's waiting for is ready will resolve the future. Let's see if I did that right. OK, great. So it still does the same thing. Um, we haven't really accomplished anything, right? In fact, the code even got a little bit worse. Um, so why are we heading off in this direction? Well, we're going to use these futures as along with generators, and that's going to be two of the three components of uh, a coroutine. So momentary digression, uh, what the heck is a generator? So in Python, if I write a function like this, let's print start and then yield one, and print middle, yield two, So these yield statements make this a generator function. Now, a generator function is just a function, but it acts funny. If you execute it, it doesn't do anything, right? It didn't print start, even though we just called it. Instead, what it did was it returned a thing called a generator. And what a generator is, is it's got some code. There it is. Uh, and it's got a stack frame. And the stack frame has, you know, it's got the locals and so on. And what's particularly interesting is that it's got an instruction pointer. It remembers where in this list of uh, Python opcodes it is. So it hasn't begun yet. That's why it didn't print start. And so its instruction pointer is negative one. So if we call, let's capture its return value. The way that we started is we call next. And now it prints start. Its instruction pointer has advanced to spot 13. And the return value of next was one, which is what we yielded. And if we call it again, then it prints middle. The return value is 2. The instruction pointer is 28. And if we call next on it again, this time it won't have a return value. And instead, it raises this special stop iteration exception. And that is Python's way of communicating to you that the coroutine, is, that the generator, it's not a coroutine yet, is completed. Um, and also, sort of interestingly, um, its frame is now empty, uh, which aids garbage cleanup. All of its locals are now gone. So the nice thing about generators is you can use them as coroutines because, so if I say, if I make a generator and then I make another generator from the same generator function, their code is the same. This means that these are actually pointers to the same code object. But their frames 
are not. Are not. Uh, <laughs> And so they have different instruction pointers and different local variables, and they can run independently. One can run to the middle while the other isn't started. So that means that we can maybe use generators as coroutines, and that'll be the basis of our async framework here. So what if, instead of creating a callback here and wrapping it in the future, what if we just yielded the future and then paused? And then we rely on somebody to resume us after the future is resolved. So let's just, I don't know, let's run this. No. So that didn't work. Um, and the reason is, see down here, now that get is a generator function, Calling it doesn't do anything. It just returns, it creates one generator and returns it. So we need something to call next on this generator and get it going. And so that's the last building block. And in async.io in the Python standard library, this thing is called a task. And it works something like this. You call it and you give it a generator. I'm going to call that coro for coroutine. And we save it. And then we start going. And I'm going to say that that's the task.step method. And the implementation of step is going to be next self coro, right? So we get it going. And then let's, it's going to yield a future. So we catch it up here. That's the return value of next. And uh, we want to do something. We want to wait for this future to be resolved. So we do that by appending a callback to it. Um, what do we want to do when this future is resolved? We probably want to call next on the coro again. So let's say that the callback here is self.step. So we'll just jump right back in here. So we're going to yield the future, receive the future, arrange to be resumed when the future is resolved, and then quit. And so that'll pop out down here once the selector tells us that what we were waiting for is ready. And so then we'll call future resolve. That will execute the callbacks. And that'll jump back in here. And that'll resume the generator at this spot where it wanted to be resumed once what it was waiting for was ready. Uh, and then we just need to actually do that wrapping there. Uh, OK, what happened? Through an exception. Oh, and it was stop iteration. So in a way, this is actually really good news, right? It means that we managed to run a coroutine to completion. Um, so uh, what do you think we should do when we receive that? Uh, I think that means that this task is complete, and so we can just return. Let's try that. Um, we right? Yay. <laughs> so uh, that's awesome. It performs just as well. And we got rid of one level of callback registration. Readable is gone. And even after we've connected, we're still in the same function. So we can just do the same transformation here. So I'm sorry, connected was the one that we got rid of. So now we can get rid of readable. Um, so let's see. We, want, we don't need a callback anymore. And we can just yield f. Uh, and so that'll have sort of the same effect that um, once the socket's readable, will be resumed down here. And we'll know that we can receive a chunk. And so we'll save it in the buffer. Um, but then we're sort of still doing callback stuff here. So this isn't the way that we want to be re-entered anymore. We want to find another way to keep receiving chunks until the request is complete. 
So I think we need a loop back here like we had way back half an hour ago, if you remember that. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're just going to keep creating futures uh, and yielding them. And then every time we're resumed, we'll check if there's a chunk. If there is, then we'll save it. We can get rid of this callback stuff, right? Because we'll just loop back up and we'll do that work up here now. Uh, and if there isn't a chunk, that means we're done. Um, and now, once again, we need to return because now we're in a, a while true loop again. Um, so let's, let's run that. It works. Uh, did we lose 10 milliseconds? Maybe we did. I don't care. <laughs> because look at how much better this is, right? Uh, we've gotten back to the point at which we have a single function. We're not registering callbacks. And what's particularly great about that is that um, this local state that we were keeping per request, you know, the socket, the buffer, the path, we don't have to manually pass this stuff around in closures anymore. We're using Python's, the Python language's support to do what we naturally expect to do, which is to have our local variables from one moment to the next. They're on the stack. Uh, well, actually, what's actually fascinating is that they're not on the stack. They're in this generator's frame, but that frame is not on the stack. That frame is part of this generator. It's a little deep. At the end, I'm going to share with you a link that explains this in a lot of detail. Um, the other awesome thing is we implemented this all in 32 and a half minutes. It's really not that bad. Um, there's some craziness in Python's own AsyncIO framework. The yield from keyword, which is sort of famous, it allows one generator to call another generator as if they were normal functions, and that's pretty awesome, and we haven't gotten to that today. Um, this stuff where we create a future, we register, we yield, we unregister, that's what async IO's job is. You don't actually have to worry about that if you're writing Python 3.4 and using its standard library. Uh, async IO will hide this from you. And you can just do something like yield from socket read. And async IO will deal with all of the future registration and selection stuff for you. The other thing you don't need to worry about in async IO is writing your own event loop. Um, async IO, pretty much its reason for being is to give you an event loop. And it's got a much more sophisticated one than this. Uh, it's also got much superior futures. Um, this is an awful buggy little future. Uh, the real ones are a lot more sophisticated. And for example, you can't resolve them twice. And you can also use them as um, values. Right? This future is more or less an event. You wait for it to happen, and then it tells you that it happened. And in a real async framework, a future could be resolved with a value. And then the function would be executed with that value. So you could say, I'm waiting for a thing, not just for an event, but for a value. And then that value will come back to me as the return value of the yield expression. So we won. We did it. Thank you very much.